Welcome, this is ECE 341 Random Processes, Part 1, Lecture 16. Last lecture, we introduced what is called the normal or Gaussian distribution. We did that from a more theoretical kind of standpoint. We looked at the nature of its probability density function and said that that guy was kind of hard uh, to carry out analytic calculations on. This lecture is going to be concentrating more on how we can practically get um, calculations associated with the normal distribution. In order for us to do that, I'm going to go ahead and just review a little bit about what we talked about in the last lecture. The normal distribution is a bell-shaped curve, like we see this one in the purple. Um, it has a peak right in the middle of the distribution located at the random variable's mean, mu. We can think about that bell um, kind of rolling off on either side of mu, so that bell has a decay rate. That decay rate is related to the variance of the distribution. The higher the variance, the slower that, that roll off and the wider the bell. So if you have a big variability, right, that stretches that bell out. If you have a small variability, that's going to squeeze that bell and make it really narrow. Last time we did talk about then a normally distributed random variable x. Our notation for that was using something like n, standing for normal, and then we gave the parameters that were necessary to define that normal distribution. And that only required two things, the mean and the variance. And we said that the normally distributed random variable x will have a probability density function given by 1 over root 2 pi divided by that sigma exp minus one half of the quantity x minus mu divided by sigma quantity squared. And so we got that guy as well. That particular distribution function is a little bit complex, um, but it's something that we can easily represent in a, in a program like MATLAB. What makes it, I guess, difficult is when we start talking about uh, carrying out some calculations involving finding probabilities. So think about a typical probability that we would be interested in for a continuous random variable. We know with continuous random variables, we're usually interested in the probability that that variable occupies some interval. So we do things like, what's the probability that A um, is less than X is less than or equal to B? Well, we can do that just from, a, from an integral standpoint, right? We integrate from A to B, right? And then we put inside that integral the probability density function. So we're essentially finding the area under the curve um, between the limits A to B, something along those lines. And we can see that in that graph above. It's shaded in that kind of a blue um, in there. So that complete area under that curve between A and B would tell us the probability that random variable X is between A and B. The difficulty here is that for the normal distribution, um, using that probability density function, there is no closed form solution to that integral. So when you have definite limits of the integration um, that are finite uh, values a and b, um, there is no closed form solution. We end up having to use things like numerical integration in order to compute that out. That's difficult. That's not something you want to do every single time. Um, it's time intensive, it's calculation intensive, and uh, we would like to try to find a better way. The better way really involves turning that arbitrary normal distribution into a what is called standard normal. We talked about this last time as well. So if I just take that random variable x, right, and I subtract its mean and divide by its standard deviation, we get what is called the standard normal, and that guy is distributed as a normal distribution with mean zero and unit variance. Any distributed, normal distributed random variable x, regardless of what its mean and its variance are, can be computed um, or con converted into a standard normal by simply subtracting off the mean and dividing uh, that by its standard deviation. It has an associated probability density function. We're not terribly interested in that. Um, it's just like the others. It just has mu equaling zero and sigma equaling one, um, but um, it's a, still got those same problems in calculation. What's nice about this? Well, if I can turn any old distribution into the standard normal, um, and if I can compute all the probabilities associated with that standard normal, um, that means I should be able to get the probabilities for any distribution I want just by converting them to the standard normal and then using those values from that single, um, that single case of the normal. So the standard normal is something that we can create um, and have been created, these tables of probabilities that tell you um, what exactly the area under the curve is at different points in time um, or points in the random variable. And and we can use those for any arbitrary distribution just by, um, by making this transformation. And we'll show several examples of that. So 
We can turn a random variable x into a standard normal by subtracting the mean and divided by the standard deviation. And we have tables for computing the probabilities involving a standard normal. In other words, if I want to have the probability that the standard normal z is less than or equal to some value little z, which involves the integral minus infinity to z of its probability density function, which is still tricky, um, we have tables that have pre-computed these guys. And at least in our book and in some other, other sources, they call those values the CDF values there. Um, phi of z. So we're going to have tables of phi of z. That's going to tell us these different areas under the curve for different values of z. If I was going to think about this graphically, we know that that standard normal right, has a mean zero, so the peak is at zero, and it's going to have a very particular kind of roll-off. right? Um, there's not going to be any, any, any kind of squeezing or stretching of the bell curve. It's going to be such that the variance is always equal to one. That's what we mean by a standard normal. That phi of z right, is just the probability um, that that um, random variable z is less than or equal to, to little z. I've shown that for a positive value of z here. So it's all that area of the curve um, to the left all the way up to and including uh, the value z. Tables for this CDF tend to cover um, positive values of z and up to um, a kind of a modest value like three. Our tables in our book go up to three and they usually stop about there. So that doesn't really give us a huge amount, right? We can figure out probabilities um, at least uh, directly from the table going from zero, right, all the way up to some value three. But if I was interested in values past three or before zero, right, those tables aren't going to directly do that. So we need to have a, a little bit of a discussion as to how we can get those other values as well. Turns out that's not too bad, um, especially if we're just talking a negative value. So this next little bit says, what would happen if we wanted a negative value of z? For example, z equaling minus one. I've drawn that particular um, case uh, sitting here. We see that, that normal, uh, standard normal probability density function. I've shown the value z equaling minus one. The CDF would be all the area up to and including z equaling minus 1, which is that shaded area or that cross-hatched area that's done in blue. Because of the symmetry, because we have this, this distribution that has even symmetry about its mean, um, we can notice something. That cross-hatched area to the, to, the, to the left of z equaling to the minus 1 is the same as that blue cross-hatched area right to the right of z equaling 1. And that puts our value z now to the right of zero instead of a negative value, right? And I know that I can find that blue area by taking the CDF at one, right? And having subtracted that from one. So using a complementary probability type of an idea. So phi of a negative value can be gotten by one minus phi of that negative value made positive. Right? And we can see that easily and graphically. And it comes out of the symmetry. And this really explains why the tables themselves only include values that are to the right of the mean, because all the other ones are unnecessary. If they're difficult values to calculate, why go through all that extra calculation if you don't need it? So um, we will do all the negative values right just by using that complement, um, that one minus of the, of the positive value. So when looking at z less than zero, right, we will just use um, the CDF of that as being one minus the negative of the value we wanted. So using a positive value, essentially. And that's what's going to be available in our table. Again, we have a lot of examples coming up. I'll show all of this. What about those cases where we're at values um, larger than three? And you could also see this as values less than minus three. Well, in this particular case, um, it's just a matter of practicality. You just get a, a, an easier way of representing significant digits to use what is called the complementary CDF. And the complementary CDF just basically gives you not the probability of everything leading up to z, but it's everything past z. So in our book's notation, they use this complementary CDF. They call it q of z, which is just 1 minus v of z. And they're going to do this for values z greater than 3. So for all the values between 0 and 3, right, we use the regular the regular CDF, that's the phi. For anything beyond 3, we're going to use the complementary CDF, that's the Q. And if we have a negative value, we just take the complement of whatever we were using before. So those tail probabilities, which tend to be really small, we're going to find that from a complementary probability um, uh, function, so a complementary CDF.
We use Q of Z then for probabilities involving those extremes or the tails of the probability density function for our standard normal. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. We'll put these into, into use. Um, in all of these examples, we're going to be talking about things that are distributed as normal. So I might have a random variable x distributed as a normal with some mean invariance. And in all cases, if I use z, I'm talking about the standard normal. Before we do that, let's run over to another application where I can just show an example of these probability tables. So I'm going to go ahead and run that up here. And here's an example of one of those tables. This is a PDF. Um, I know it's got a lot of values just running across right now. Um, this is something that will be available on exams. Um, it's also available on the website, and there's similar tables to this in the book. If I zoom in a little bit here, we're going to see a couple of things, right? We're going to see the fact that there's some value z, and what do we see? We see those values of z start at zero, right? So we see those values z starting at zero, and it goes on down until we hit z equaling three. So what does that mean? Um, we're going to be getting values that are going to give us essentially um, the CDF, right, for z going from zero to three. Well, well, that's zero to three standard deviations to the right of the mean. And then it tells us what are the CDF values of that. So it tells us the area under the curve, if, if you wanted to think about it in that way. Take a really easy one. If I take the really easy one of z equaling zero, what does that mean? That says, what's the probability that a standard normal, right, has a value z less than or equal to zero, less than or equal to its mean, essentially. We know that that's a symmetric distribution, and that should be half the probability. And that's exactly what we see here. We see 50% of the probability, right, is below the mean, which is um, completely expected from the, from the shape of these guys. We'll do a bunch of others. If you go across just a little bit over there, you can see that if I'm one standard deviation out, right, I've got about 84% of the probability. If I go two standard deviations out, I get about 97.7% of the probability. And so we can just read these off. It's just number of standard deviations beyond the mean, essentially. So I'm going to go ahead and erase these in preparation for some of the stuff that we will do later. But the, the tables here are very easy to work with, and we're going to, we're going to use them in a couple of ways. In this one that's available for our class and that will be on exams, I've also put side by side some of those complementary CDF values as well. So they start up and pick up around three, so three standard deviations out, and it just tells you what's the probability that we are more than three standard deviations away from the mean. And what you see is that that's a pretty small value, 1.3499, right, times 10 to the minus three. So these are tiny probabilities. If I wrote that out as a render, as a as a regular CDF, it would be something like 0.9999 something and you'd waste all this space writing all those nines and it would get a lot worse if you go down further in these guys we see it goes out to the minus six or to the minus seven so you would just have a huge number of nines going out there not a good way to represent small numbers and that's why we use that that complementary part because we can we can get rid of all those point nines and we can just concentrate on the digits that are important to us those small values Okay, so let's go back to our lecture and take a look back at then, um, in this particular case, some examples. So in this first case, I'm going to take a look at our rule of thumb. If you remember our rule of thumb calculation, we said something like, um, we would use as a rule of thumb, especially if it's a distribution that is kind of bell-shaped, um, that that random variable is within um, plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean should be about 95%. So we said something about that guy being about 95%. I just want to see how this works for the normal distribution, something along those lines. So I'm taking a look at what's the probability that a Gaussian distribution is between mu minus two sigma to mu plus two sigma. So plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean. I don't want to do this in terms of the general. I want to get it in terms of the, of, the, of the standard normal because that's the thing I have the probability tables for. So I'm going to use the basic strategy that we always think about. We're just going to take that random variable x and we're going to subtract the mean and then divide everything by the standard deviation. So working in the middle here, I'm going to take x minus mean divided by standard deviation, right? Something like that. And because I did it in the middle, I'm going to have to do it on all the sides. So I'm going to have mu plus two sigma minus mu. That's just going to be two sigma, right? Two sigma, and I could have written that in there, mu plus two sigma minus mu. So I subtract it off the mean, and I'm going to divide by the standard deviation. Mu minus mu is zero. Two sigma over sigma is equal to two, right? So we're going to be looking at two on the right-hand side. So two standard deviations away from the mean. If I look on the left-hand side, I'm going to get mu minus two sigma. So I'm going to have mu minus two sigma, right, minus mu 
all over sigma. And if I do that, we see that that is minus 2. So I'm going to be looking at what's the probability, right, that my standard normal, because the standard normal we know always comes out of that x minus b over sigma, is between minus 2 and 2, that it's within two standard deviations of its mean, which is now normalized to 0. We can get that. We've already seen what this looks like. This should be what? It should be phi of 2 minus phi of minus 2, something along those lines. And if I was going to draw this out, um, having some sort of a kind of a graphic on here, I'd come out here one, two standard deviations. I'm just eyeballing it right now, going up two standard deviations, so minus two to two. I'm looking for the probability that I'm in that interval. That's going to be this area here, something like this. And the way we're going to compute that is we're going to take out phi of 2 first, right? That brings everything up to 2. And then we're going to subtract off phi of minus 2, which uh, gets rid of that, that tail that I didn't want, the, the tail on the left that I didn't want included in there. Okay, so all of this is pretty basic. What's the problem here? This is not in our table, not in the table, right? Because it involves a negative value. So I need to turn this into a positive probability, which is uh, something we, we talked about as well. This is easy. We're going to have our phi of 2, and we know to get phi of minus 2, we are just going to have 1 minus phi of the positive value, so 1 minus phi of 2. And if I do all of that, I get what? I get 2 phi of 2 minus 1, something along those lines. So let's go back over to our table, right? And let's find phi of 2, right? Phi of 2. Well, here's the value z equaling 2, right? So I see that in my table. I've got z equaling 2. And phi of 2 then is 0 0.97725. So that's the value that I need for this particular calculation, 0 0.97725. Let's go ahead and go back to our thing and put it in there. So if I do that, I am going to get in this particular case, I'm going to get 2, right, times 0 0.9775. Two five, and then I had that minus one on the other side, minus one. Throw that into your calculator, and what do we get on this? We get zero point nine five four five. Is it perfectly ninety five percent? No, it's not. Is it really dang close? Yeah, pretty good rule of thumb. So this matches nicely with our rule of thumb in in this particular case. The Gaussian uh, uh, distribution uh, behaves well under this rule of thumb. The likelihood that you're within plus or minus two standard deviations, the thing that would give you that kind of ninety five percent. Um, should be um, about two standard deviations, right? Plus or minus two standard deviations gives us about 95. If we went back to the table, which I'll just do briefly, if I really wanted it to be exactly um, something like a 95, that means each tail would have to be what? It would have to be two and a half percent, and I'd be looking for the value z, right, that gives me 0.975. So two is a little bit too much. I could keep going back through these guys, and I could look for where I get 0.975. Five. Oh, well, there it is right there. 0 0.975 happens at 1.96 standard deviations. So if you actually wanted to be um, really accurate in the case of a standard normal, right, if you really wanted to know what was the 95% uh, population including, we would be going uh, from minus 1.96 standard deviations to 1.96 standard deviations. That will include 95% of our, of our values. Okay. Let's go back and, and work on another example. So second example that we're going to deal with. Suppose that I had a random variable x that was distributed normally with a mean of 20 and a variance equaling to 9. And I just want to know what's the probability that x is less than 24. If I was going to sketch this out just like in a really, really brief way, right, so I could have my distribution out here, I know that I have some sort of normal distribution, right? There's that mean that's going to be at 20, right? And then we're coming out here to some value like 24, and I want to find the, the probability of that. So, so we're looking for something like that. The problem with that is that we have no direct table that involves, you know, a normal distribution that has mean 20 and and variance equaling 9. We want to convert this into a standard normal. So I'm going to do the same, same technique that I did before. This probability that x is less than or equal to 24 is equal to the probability of what? Of x minus its mean mu over sigma being less than or equal to 24 minus that mean by sigma. Go ahead and plug in those values. That's going to be 24 minus what was the mean? 20. And what's the standard deviation? It's just the square root of the, of the variance. We had a variance of 9 here, so the square root of that is going to be 3, something like that. 
So if I go just a little further on this, this is the probability. X minus mu over sigma is our standard normal, z, right? That's uh, being less than or equal to. 24 minus 20 is 4. 4 over 3 is just 4 thirds. So I'm just looking at what's the probability that I am um, no greater than one and a third standard deviations away from the mean, basically in there. So if I came and do that, I would come over here to a value four thirds, something like that, and I'm looking for this probability sitting over there. Four thirds is about what? 1.333333 going on forever, something like that. That should definitely be uh, computable using our standard, um, standard normal CDF table. So this is going to be equal to what? That's that fee of 4.3. Nothing special here that I seem to be needing right now, just because that's a value between 0 and 3. I should be able to get it straight out of the tables. Let's go ahead and take a look at the tables. So coming over here to the tables, I'm going to go ahead and be looking for, I'm looking for something that is um, 1.33333, right? 1.333 standard deviation. So I'm going to search here through here. If you look at this, um, for example, so we're looking under these values of, of values of Z, I'm looking for 1.3333, something like that. So I come down through here and I see one that is 1.33, right? But that's not exactly 1.3333 repeating forever. There is a 1.34, but that's a little too much. So 1.33 is a little too little and 1.34 is a little too much. So here's what we do in this situation. Over these small intervals, over these small adjacent values in the table, if I'm looking for a value here, right? One is 1.33 standard deviations, one is 1.34 standard deviations, and I'm looking for 1.3333333, right? Um, a third of the way between the first and the second. Um, I'm going to take these two values over here. So I'm going to take 0 0.90824 and 0 0.90988, and I'm going to linearly interpolate that. I'm going to go one third of the distance between there so that I can find the closest value, at least within um, the approximation of linear interpolation, to correspond to the actual amount of standard deviations I want to do, 1.333 repeating forever. So let's go ahead and go back to the, to the, to the thing over here, and we'll work on that as well. So if I take a look at that guy, I could look at the fact that phi of 1.33, right, is going to be equal to 0 0.90824. Phi of 1.34 is equal to 0 0.90988. Nine we had done something like that. So I'm interested in this phi of 4 thirds, right? That's 1.33333. I can start out, I can say that that's approximately phi of what? 1.33, right? And then I'm going to say, I know that that was a little too small, so I'm going to take a third. Whoops, that wasn't quite the third I wanted. I want to go a third of however much was the difference between uh, the current value and the next bigger value. So a third of phi, right, of 1.34 minus phi of 1.33. So this gives me um, this phi of 1.34 minus phi of 1.33. That gives me the change over an interval 0.01. Um, I didn't want to go uh, that full amount. I just wanted to go one third of that so I could get that extra 0.333 going on in there. And then I just add that to the to the other. It's a linear interpolation. If I was going to zoom in on the on the on the curve, we know that that normal is coming down something like this. And the table gives me a value like this according to 1.33. And there's another value here according to 1.34. We know it's curved, but we're going to say that we're going to just approximate this guy as a straight line. And we were looking for 1.333, that, that third waypoint in there. So I'm trying to find that value, right? So I'm doing what? I'm looking at the distance here, difference, right? And then I'm taking a third of that and adding it to this value so I can go from here to that, get a little bit more accurate. All right, if I do all of that, if I stuff that into the calculator here, I end up getting this guy, phi of 4 thirds, as being equal to 0 0.908. Seven, nine. So let's just take a quick look at this guy, okay? That tells me what? The likelihood that x was less than 24, it x, remember, was a um, normal distribution with mean 20, right, and variance 9. So it's 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 about 91%, not quite 91%, uh, so we said 90.879%. The tables themselves would have said what? If I had just kind of not done that linear interpolation, um, I would have gotten reasonably close. I would have said uh, 90.8 in, in, in one case or 90.9 in the other case. 
Um, all I've done is I've refined it through linear interpolation. And really, you should do that. If you're not if you're not lying right on one of those values, just linear interpolate it. It will get your value uh, closer. Uh, later, when we do um, some computer uh, simulations, like you do in homework, and also that we did last um, last lecture, um, you can you can actually get uh, quite a bit more accurate, or at least uh, um, more precise in that. All right, so let's look at example number three in this particular case. Example number three, I'm going to do um, in kind of an electronics um, kind of a situation. So in this particular case, I'm going to think about a manufacturer, a manufacturer. Um, so let's call it a manufacturer, manufacturer of resistors, Rogers resistors. So manufacturer of resistors, right? Um, wants, wants some resistors, wants some resistors, which are going to be distributed as normal resistors. They're going to have a nominal value of 100, right? So 100 ohm resistors. And they're going to have to have some variability. Manufacturing processes aren't perfect. The more precise you make them, so the smaller the variance, the more costly it is. Um, and so uh, there is some variability in there. What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to work on the amount of variability we should allow to meet a particular specification. So this manufacturer of resistors wants their normally distributed resistors, these hundred ohm resistors, to have to have ninety percent of the resistors, ninety percent of the resistors within the mean one hundred plus or minus ten. That means that I want my, my resistor values, 90% of them. When I sell a whole bunch of these resistors to customers, right, um, there should be 90% of the resistors that fall in the interval 90 to 110. I think many of you have seen this sort of stuff. You've gone to the parts shop. You've looked for a particular resistor of interest. Um, you go in there and you grab a 100 ohm resistor. And if you actually measure the thing, it's never 100 ohms, right? It, it varies around that. And it's oftentimes following something pretty close to a Gaussian. We just want to control the variability in our manufacturing process such that 90%. So if you were looking for this thing in your 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 your, your specifications of your design really required that if you called for a nominal 100 ohm resistor, anything between like 90 and 110 would probably work out close enough. Um, we want that to be 90% likely. So we're just putting some kind of limits on, on the variability in these resistors. Well, how would we do that? So we want the probability that 90 is less than R is less than or equal to 110, right? We're within 10 of that nominal value or the mean value of 100, right? We want that probability to be equal to 0 0.90, something like that. Well, what is the probability that 90 is less than R is less than 110? I could also write that as a probability of, and I could take R minus its mean, that's 100, divided by the standard deviation, divided by sigma. That that is between then, so what happens when I take 110 minus 100? That's 10, divided by sigma, that's 10 by sigma. And on the other side, I'm going to have 90 minus 100, that's minus 10, so I'm going to have minus 10 by sigma, something like this. I'm looking for the probability that a Gaussian minus its mean divided by the standard deviation, well, what's that? That's just z, right? So we know we're looking for z here. So I'm looking for the probability, right, that minus 10 over sigma is less than our random variable z is less than or equal to 10 over sigma. That is, if we kind of did that in here, you know, we're looking at something like, we said it was about 90%, something like that. So we're looking for something like this. We want that guy to be 0.90. So we know the probability. What we don't know is how far to go. We're coming over here 10 by sigma, and we're coming over here minus 10 by sigma. So how do we compute these guys? Well, we can do it in our standard way. We know that this is because it involves a standard normal. That is phi of 10 by sigma. Sigma is always a non-negative parameter. So 10 divided by sigma is, is just a, a positive number, right? It's, it's greater than 0. The other one being a negative, we aren't going to get it directly from the table. So let's do that as a complement. So minus 1 minus phi of the negative of that value. So phi of 10 by sigma. Actually, that's pretty convenient. Um, so now we'll be able to combine those two together. That tells us what? 2 phi, right, of 10 by sigma, right, minus 1 needs to be equal to 0.9. So let's let's do a little bit with that. Let's add 1 to both sides, right? So that's going to be 1.9 equals 2 phi, divide by 2, and that tells me that this phi, right, of 10 by sigma, 10 by, um, where do I get that guy? Nope, that's not what I want. I want 10 by, whoops, we're really all over. Um, let's find back where I was at. 10 by, 10 by 
sigma, right, needs to be less than 1.9 divided by 2. That's 0.95, something like that. So I'm looking for a value z, right? Or we think about when we look at that, that's some value z. We're looking for the value z that gives us 0.95, right? It gives us 0.95. We're going to be switching the roles of the columns, right? In the past examples, we were given the value of z, and we're trying to find the probability. In this case, we're given the value of the probability, and we're trying to find the value of z. So let's go back and take a look at that guy. Let's look over at where that is. I'm looking for 0.95. So I'm going to keep going down through here and oh we're getting really close here so I'm going to focus on these two values I can see in this particular case that one is a little bit under 0.95 the other one's a little bit over 0.95 so 1.64 standard deviations from the mean will give us just a little too little and 1.65 standard deviations from the mean will give us just a little bit too much we can again just use linear interpolation just like we did before. We're linear interpolating on the other way, right, the other direction, and we're going to find what fraction of that of that distance between 6.4 and 6.5, right, um, gives us um, wherever 0.95 is between that other interval, 0.94950 and 0.95053. And so we just need to do a little linear interpolation. So I'll take those values and we'll go back to our other guy um, and we'll we'll see if we can we can figure all these guys out. So in this particular case, what am I going to have? I'm going to go back to my pen in here, and I know that phi, right, of 1.64 is equal to 0 0.94950. Phi of 1.65 was equal to 0 0.95, right, 053. If you look at the difference in there, the delta on those guys, that is equal to 0 0.00103, something like that. And if I wanted to figure out then, right, um, where 0.95 is in there, where is 0.95 um, on an interval that goes 0.94 and 950 all the way to 0.95053, um, we, can, we can easily find that out. That turns out to be roughly halfway through, right, roughly halfway through. We can see that there's about 50 below um, 0.95 and a 53 above that. Um, so it's just a little skewed to, to the left in there. If we go ahead and figure figure that distance out, what the relative distance is of 0.95, right? So just do that do that fraction um, between uh, 0.94950 and 0.95053, the fraction of that guy. So 0.95, 0 0.95 is 0.4854. Of the interval of delta, right, from that 0 0.94950. You can go calculate that out. So we're just a little under half. We can we can see that pretty easy in here. So now I just need to find what's the corresponding um, uh, value of, of z in there, right? That corresponding value of z. So I start in this particular case, and um, I I know that uh, I am. Um, um, going to try to find that that corresponding value of z here in this particular case maybe if i wanted to be just a little bit more more clear on this and i'm running out of a little bit of space so i'm going to just do a little bit of, of erasing here i didn't quite give myself enough we would be doing something like this 0.95 minus right the phi of 1.64 right that's the distance 0.95 is from the lower value divided by the total interval width 0 0.00103 if you do that calculation let me go ahead and, and, and clean this up if you do that calculation that's how you get that 0.4850 it's just telling us the fraction of that guy so how do we use that guy well i know that 10 over sigma, that's the value we're looking for, right, the z, if you will, is going to be 1.64 plus that same fraction. So we're going to be talking 0.4850 of 0.54, if I can get this right, we've already done this, 0.54 of the distance between adjacent values on the z side, which was 0.64 to 0.65. They're separated by distance 0 0.01. So it's just linear interpolation again. And if you go through all of that, we get 10 by sigma, right, um, being equal to, well, let's just do the, the calculation. I'd already done this in my calculator. Um, I went ahead and took 0 0.01 times 0 0.4850, added that to 1.64, right, um, took 1 over that times 10, and that was equal to my sigma. So my sigma here, just solving for sigma, ends up giving me 6.0796. And if you found the variance, sigma squared, that would be 36.9611, something like that. 
So we need to have something whose variability is just a little short of 37 ohms squared here in this case, or its standard deviation is just a little more than six ohms, right? And actually that should make some sense too. What is our rule of thumb? Our rule of thumb is that 95% is within plus or minus two standard deviations. What's two times that sigma? That's 12, right? That 12 is a little more than the 10 here, but that also includes a little more probability, 95% versus what I wanted, which was 90%, right? So is in this particular example, we just went backwards, right? We went backwards. Instead of using a known value of Z to find a probability, we took a known or desired probability and we found the corresponding value of Z. And because it was between elements in our table, we still use that same overall idea of linear interpolation between the two. One more example on this. So this fourth example um, is, is um, just a little bit to show that complementary CDF type of an idea. So if you, if you take a look um, at the, the, the basic construction on IQ, um, IQ is a measure of something. Um, you know, it was uh, heavily relied on before as an indicator of intelligence. There's a lot of controversy on that, but let's just say that there's this thing called IQ that's measured on a test. These tests are calibrated so that the average score on these tests comes out to a IQ of 100. And they're also calibrated so that the, that the variability in the IQ score has a standard deviation of 15, which means its variance is 15 squared. And we know things like intelligence are, are, are essentially normally distributed. Um, most of these kind of measurable characteristics associated with, with things like humans or, or, or other kind of natural phenomena oftentimes follow uh, these normal-like distributions. So IQ is very well measured or very well modeled by a normal distribution, and it's designed to have a mean 100, and its variance is also um, designed to be 15. We can take a look at things like uh, what is considered genius IQ. You go out and do a Google search on that. Uh, one of the definitions of a genius IQ is something like 160 or greater, something like that. So I'm interested in what's the probability of someone being a genius um, under this designation? What is the probability that your IQ is greater than 160? Assuming that IQs right, um, uh, are normally distributed, not a, not, a, not a difficult assumption, and we know that the tests were designed um, and calibrated so that their means are 100 and their standard deviation is 15. Same thing that we'd seen before, right? So this is a probability that IQ minus 100 over the standard deviation 15. That whole thing gives me the standard normal Z variable. What's the, that being greater than or equal to? You have to do the same stuff. 160 minus 100 over 15. That's going to be 60 over 15, which is equal to 4. So we're looking at the probability that we are more than four standard deviations from the mean. That's this like little tiny probability. And it's also pointing to the right. So this turns out to be one that matches very nicely with our idea idea of a complementary CDF. That is Q of four. So I just need to go look up Q of four in our, in our, in our tables. That gives me that little tiny tail probability. So let's go ahead and go over there and do that. If I come back over here, you see a double line in the middle of this thing. To the left of that double line, we're talking the regular CDF, the phi of Zs. And if you look to the right, now we're talking things that are what? They're those Q of Zs, the complementary uh, CDFs. And we were wanting to look for four. Well, there's the value four, right? Right? And what's the probability? 3.1671 times 10 to the minus 5. Seems pretty small to me. Let's go ahead and copy that guy over there and we'll finish this, uh, this example or this uh, problem out. So we know that that guy just by table is equal to what? That guy is equal to 3.1671 times 10 to the minus 5. I don't know, maybe you uh, maybe, uh, are fine with that. Um, I'm going to put this back over. What are we computing? We're computing the probability that you're a genius, something along those lines. So the probability that you're a genius. If I take um, 3.1671 times 10 to the minus 5 and represent that as 1 over something, that is 1 over, do this on your calculator, you get 31,575. So it takes about 30,000 people, right? You're going to have to go through about 30,000 people to find one that would meet this definition of genius. If you look at the Fargo-Moorhead area, it's somewhere between, you know, 250 to maybe 300,000 people. So we're talking maybe by this definition, only 10 people in the Fargo-Moorhead area would hit this level of genius. So it is um, a, quite a high standard in this particular example, in this particular case. Okay, just a few more things and then we'll finish this lecture out. Um, I would like to go ahead and introduce uh, some, some ideas uh, that will allow us to incorporate both continuous time and discrete time elements into a single distribution. And that's something called a mixed random variable. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to talk about something called the delta function.
If you've had a class like signals, this will look very, very familiar. There's something called a Dirac delta function. We're going to notate that as delta of x. And really, a delta function has two primary characteristics. This delta function is a function of a continuous variable x. And its two properties are the following. This delta x is 0 for all values x not equaling to 0. That means it's 0 almost everywhere. But it is a function that, when you integrate it, has unit area. So this is really interesting. It's zero everywhere except for at a point. But somehow, at that point, it's still able to have finite area. How can we maybe think about this? We can get a little bit of a graphical motivation by looking at a function that is a little rectangular pulse of width, cap T, and height, 1 over cap T. And I'm going to let that width shrink down to a point. So I'm going to let cap T go to zero. When we do that, we get the two properties um, that are required of a delta function. If cap t goes to zero, right, so we have this cap t go to zero, what happens to the overall delta or this function? It is zero everywhere except at zero, right, because it no longer has any width. However, as we let cap t go to zero, as its width gets smaller and smaller and smaller, what happens to its height? That is 1 over a really tiny number, so that's going to go off to infinity. So the height here, as this t goes to 0, right, we see that it goes to 0 everywhere, but we see that the height of this guy, right, the height approaches infinity, but in such a way that it integrates to 1. We know that a rectangle of width t and height 1 over t has area t times 1 over t is 1. It's fixed at 1. We'll graphically notate this, even though it has an infinite height. We'll still show it on a regular kind of graph here. Um, we'll show it as this, this kind of arrow on top of a line, right? So that's our delta function. And the number right to the side of it just tells us its area. You'll never be able to draw it out at an infinite height. That, that just wouldn't make any sense. So we're going to use this kind of arrow notation to indicate these delta functions. And we'll just put their, their area as a number to the right, something along those lines. <laughs> We can combine the two properties of this delta function into a single equation. This is something called the sifting formula. If I integrate a function times the shifted delta, we get that function at wherever that delta function is located. So what is the delta function like this? If I have delta x minus x naught, this guy is non-zero everywhere its argument is zero. So x minus x naught equaling zero or x equaling x naught. So here's x and there's an x naught and I've got my delta function, something like that. I have my underlying function going on something like that and I'm multiplying them together when I'm multiplying them together it's gonna be a product it's gonna be zero everywhere that the Delta is zero the only place it could be non-zero is at x equaling x naught and at that point you get g of x at x naught that's g of x naught and then we're left with the integral of a delta function which is one so you'll get the area of that delta function being one and you get the the, the finish of this proof it's not it's not terribly mysterious so um, this guy combines both of the properties of a delta function the fact that it's zero everywhere except for at a single point right which in this case was shifted and that the area of that delta function is equal to one We've also seen um, in previous lectures something called a unit step. That unit step is 1 for values greater than or equal to 0. It's 0 for values less than 0. Turns out if I do a accumulating area, right? So I, integral from min I integrate from minus infinity to x of this delta function. Before x hits 0, so if I drew this out on a graph, something like this, I'm going to have my delta function sitting here at 0, right? And it has some height um, or area equaling to 1. If my value x is sitting off here to the left here, and I'm accumulating area up to that x, right? Um, we aren't going to see anything until x hits that delta function, which occurs at what value? It occurs at 0. So before 0, I'm going to get 0. Once x, the value, goes to the other side, right, I'm going to be integrating then all the way past that delta function. I know the integral of the delta function is 1. And that's exactly what the unit step says. When x is to the left of that delta function, right, less than 0, I'm going to get 0. But once I hit or pass that delta function, right, I'm going to get a value 1. That's the unit step. So we can relate a unit step to the delta function through integration. Of course, we can do it the other way. We can take this total expression here, this entire expression here, and I can just differentiate with respect to x. What does that give me? That gives me delta x being equal to the derivative of a unit step. If I have something like a unit step, so I'm going to go ahead and draw my unit step in here, right? This unit step looks something like that, and I differentiate it. What's the derivative sitting over here? Well, it's flat. It's zero, right? That gives me something like zero. 
flat over here. That's something zero. What's the derivative at this point? Um, sometimes you might have had troubles with this, right? That's that huge jump discontinuity. Well, what we've learned by looking at this thing called the Dirac delta function is when you have a discontinuity, right, we can represent that derivative using this delta function, this Dirac delta function. So think about what this does. Um, it's 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 kind of neat, actually. The Dirac delta function, right, it's a function of a continuous variable x that will let us concentrate finite probability, think of that as area, at a single point. So that allows us in the realm of a continuous variable x, right, to have points that accumulate probability at a single point. That's like discrete random variable behavior. So basically, we can use these delta functions to come up with models of discrete random variables, right? Um, as long as we're willing to use these delta functions. And we can do it within the framework of a continuous random variable. So let's look at just straight discrete random variables using deltas. We had actually seen this before when we had done estimates of a CDF. We had done um, some empirical CDFs and we found that we could get them by sums of their, their frequency of occurrence with some shifted unit steps. Well, we can also just get the straight CDF, right, as a sum over the range space of our discrete random variable of the individual probabilities each weighted by a shifted unit step. And what does that give us? That gives us the kind of graphs that are, are typical, right? If you thought about something like a binomial, right, if I took a binomial distribution, it has values possible 0 and 1. Before I hit 0, there's nothing. When I hit 0, I have whatever probability of 0, and I'm going to add um, or multiply that by a unit step. So that might jump up to, let's say, a half. That would be typical. And when I got to 1, the other value, right, I would jump up again. So that was a typical binomial, like flip a coin CDF. Well, what does that look like? That looks like a unit step with value one half. So we could think of this whole thing as being what? One half u of x plus one half u, whoops, got that slightly wrong, u of x minus one, which is exactly what this thing did over here for us. Two values in my range space, zero and one, right? Those are my shifts of the unit step, and they're each weighted by their individual probabilities. That gives us this stair-steppy look at CDF. Once I have something like that, right, I can just differentiate it and I can get the probability density now. This is interesting. It is a probability density. And we know it's a probability density because we're looking at it as a function of the continuous variable x. So instead of getting values that are the probability at a particular point, you're going to get delta functions whose areas are the probability at that particular point. So we know that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, and the derivative of a unit step just gives us those direct delta functions. So really not too bad. If I was going to look at this guy, um, same thing, like this binomial, what would I get? I would get a delta function with area half at zero, and I'd get a delta function with, with area half at one. That's just the derivative, right? That's just the derivative of this guy sitting over here. Everywhere you see a jump discontinuity, right, you get a delta function. And the size of that jump, right, is the amount of area. That's the half and the half. So no problem. We can make discrete random, discrete random like variables using a continuous variable x. Why is this useful? You know, for just purely discrete random variables, you probably should just stick with what we talked about in previous chapters. But there are situations when we have random variables that exhibit both continuous and discrete random variable characteristics. This is something called a mixed random variable. I'm going to give this single example, and then we'll be done uh, with the lecture today. Suppose that a random variable x takes on the single value 0 50% of the time. So it's kind of like a coin toss. Half the time, you're going to just get out of value 0. Every time I flip a coin and I get tails, I'm going to say that my outcome is 0. But on the other half, right, when I got ahead, if you will, I'm going to make x take a value on the interval 0 to 1, right, uniformly. So this is a little bit different. It has stuff that is continuous-like, right? That's this guy. That's continuous-like. And it has stuff that is discrete-like, right, where it has probability at individual points. I can create a density function for this by doing the continuous part. That's the blue, right? One half over the interval, zero to one. Total, total probability there is 50%. A rectangle of width one and height one half gives us 50% error, or 50, uh, 0.5 area, or 50% of the probability. And then all the rest of it is concentrated at that zero, single point, that zero. Um, and we can get that discrete like character with this with this direct delta function. It's just weighted by a half, so making its area one half. 
If I wrote that out in an equation format, I'd say that the probability density function has a half delta x. Anywhere you see a delta, that's like the discrete part. And then there's that other stuff. Like here, I have a half u of x minus u of x minus 1. That's a continuous part. This guy is a uniform, right? Just weighted by the overall probability um, of having uniform distribution um, for that piece, half in this case. If I checked out the CDF in this case, look at what you get. Before I hit anything, I sit there at 0. When I hit zero, though, I get that kind of behavior typical in a CDF of a discrete random variable. I get a jump. I get a jump of 50%. That means the probability, right, that x equals zero equals 50%, 0.5. Just like a discrete random variable, an individual point has a non, you know, it has a, a probability, an actual value greater than zero. Continuous random variables, on the other hand, usually don't have any probability at single points. And what do we see in their CDFs? We see stuff like a gradual accumulation. You'd never see the slope, right, in a discrete random variable CDF. You only saw staircases. So this has the slope typical of a continuous random variable, and it has the jump typical of a discrete random variable. But the basics of the CDF are the same. Starts at zero, ends at one, never decreases, right? It has jumps that are indicative of discrete like contempt, and then it has just kind of gradual ramp ups where we're accumulating probability per, per interval of time or interval of the random variable. That's the continuous part. We'll pick up on this on the next lecture, um, but that will be after our, our exam.